And in the last part of the lecture, we'll briefly go over interaction of particles with matter. So you have much better overview of all of this in the next parts of the course, where different detectors and their principles will be discussed in more details and with more examples. So here is an, as an illustration, I have an image of the rather new Swiss banknote of 200 Swiss francs, which, as you can see, features a generic particle physics detector with a proton-proton collision at the center and many, many particles appearing as a result and going through the various sub-detector system. As you saw previously, uh, particle size is rather small, smaller than 10 to the minus 15, the power of minus 15 meters as proton radius. And uh, it can be compared to the wavelength, which is reached by an electron microscope, which is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So from here, it becomes clear that visualizing by eye is impossible for particles. Therefore, we need to have an indirect detection with devoted instruments. There exist many different types of particle detectors, like scintillators, bubble or cloud chambers, wire chambers, etc. But all of them rely on the detection of a perturbation, which is induced in matter by a passing particle. In most cases, this perturbation is either an ionization electric signal or excitation, scintillation light of atoms through electromagnetic interactions between the incident particle and atomic electrons. Therefore, it works only for charged particles and the photon. All detectors have some sensitive volume in which this perturbation occurs. Like for example, gas, like argon or CO2, liquid like water or solid, like silicon, emulsion, ice, etc. Now let's talk about these processes in a bit more detail. So in this slide, a cartoon demonstration of the ionization is shown. So when a charged particle passes through the medium, can kick out an electron from the atom and then a track of positive and negative charge charges is formed on its trajectory which can therefore then be collected and redoubt with dedicated means the ionization energy loss per unit length traversed is given by beta block equation which you will see several more times during this course this equation is given here and the, the components in this equation are the following so V here is just the speed of the traversing particle. Z is the atomic number of the material and its number density. IE is the effective ionization potential of the material averaged over all atomic electrons. The rate of ionization loss does not depend significantly on the material except through its density rho. We can see it if we express n as rho divided by a where a is the atomic mass number and m which is the unified atomic mass unit so you can see that one over rho d over dx is proportional to z over a and approximately is a constant and the most important graph to remember is basically this one it shows the uh, this quantity, 1 over rho d over dx, as the fun function of beta gamma of a particle. Uh, you can see that there are basically three uh, main structures in this graph. At the beginning, you have very quick drop of the energy uh, loss, which is proportional to 1 over v squared. So it's this term, which is important here. Then at the end, we have relativistic rise, which is proportional to logarithm of gamma factor squared. And minimum, uh, which is characteristic to minimum ionizing particle and it occurs typically at value of beta gamma equal approximately to three. So basically in principle, we can see that energy loss is more or less constant for relativistic particles, and it becomes very important for very slow particles. 
Then what is interesting is that at MIP level, at the minimum ionizing particle level, um, if a particle doesn't have any other mechanisms of losing of the energy, then they can travel very large distance. So for example, muons in iron would lose 13 MeV per centimeter and therefore can have a range of several meters in the iron before they are stopped. Now, the second important mechanism is scintillation. Uh, basically, what happens there? Scintillator molecules are excited by traversing charged particle or a photon, which leads to emission of more photons. Then, if the medium itself is transparent to the emitted photons, they can be detected. And the light usually is guided to photodetectors for amplifying and detecting the signal. Typically, we have two categories of scintillators, organic, like for example, plastics. They have low density and low Z, and they're very fast. Or inorganic, this would be typically crystals with high density and high Z, and good for high energy photons. Then another mechanism of particles losing their energy is Cherenkov radiation. So it is a coherent photon emission at a fixed angle of theta here to the trajectory of the charged particle. It happens when the velocity of the particle in this direction is greater than the speed of light in the medium. So V is greater than C divided by N, where N is the refraction index. This threshold behavior is utilized to aid the identification of particles of a given momentum P. Light is produced at the angle with cosine theta equal one over n beta. And of course, light will be emitted only if beta is greater than one over n. So from here, you can see that mass of the particle should be smaller than p times n squared minus n. So if mass is greater than this value, no Cherenkov light is emitted. If smaller, then light is emitted. So it allows to uh, distinguish between different types of particles passing through the medium. And finally, uh, what we can discuss is Bremsstrahlung and electron-positron pair production. Bremsstrahlung is the main energy loss mechanism for electrons with energies above a critical energy, which is equal to about 800 over Z MeV. So basically it means it's practically always for current particle experiments. Then another important thing is that Probability of Bremsstrahlung is inversely proportional to the mass squared of the particle. Therefore, it's not important for muons and heavier particles. So it really matters mostly for electrons. And the second process is pair creation, which is dominant energy loss mechanism for photons with energy greater than 10 mV. A photon converts to a pair to, of electron and positron in the external uh, electric field. Quantum scattering, uh, where we have photon scattering on an electron, is important for energies of the photons of about 1 MeV. And photoelectric effect is a low energy photon absorption by an atomic electron ejected from the atom. On this plot, you can see a balance of importance of various processes for a photon as the function of photon energy. You can see if you go to energies of 10 MeV or more, pair production is what would be dominating everything. And then when we go back to the very low energies and find how the photon should be absorbed in the media, it's, it will be basically mostly through the photo effect. One important material characteristic which characterizes the development of the electromagnetic showers there is the radiation lens X0. And it corresponds to the average distance over which the energy of an electron is reduced by Bremsstrahlung by a factor of one over E. And it's also equal to the seven ninths of the mean free path of the electron positron pair creation for a photon. Examples for typical high Z materials would be iron with radiation lens of about 1.8 centimeters or lead with radiation lens of about six millimeters. So you can see that 
and the zero is rather short and therefore it allows to build very rather compact detectors. Now in this plot, you see an example of the electromagnetic shower, which is developed as alternating from Straubing and pair creation processes. Now, as a summary, uh, I show again, layout and main components of particle physics experiments, which have first tracking chambers allow, allowing to see charged particles, like electrons, muons, charged hadrons, electromagnetic colorimeter, which allows to measure energy of the photon or electron, hadron colorimeter, which allows to measure energy of charge or neutral hadrons, and muon chambers, which detect anything which is not absorbed in the electromagnetic or hadron colorimeters. And such particles are muons, basically. And then what is not shown here is Cherenkov detectors, which allow to determine particle speed or its type. Then relative position of various types of particle detectors is typically optimized to collect all the possible information about particles produced in the initial collision. Now, again, we have several questions to think about and to discuss in the next lecture. Um, first question is, which particles can traverse all the LHC detectors and fly further? And choice is electron, muon, tau lepton, neutrino, or charge K. And again, the same plot with the mass spectrum, which you, did, which you already saw. And the question is, so previously you saw that um, particles should correspond to mass peaks in the spectrum. Now the question is what determines the width of these peaks and why some peaks are wider and some are more narrow. 